parents, judges, colleagues, and friends. My name is Lori Cheney, and as the senior team leader, it is my privilege to welcome you to the Jeffrey C. Stewart Senior Seminar Exhibition of Finalists. This special day is named in honor of senior team member Jeff Stewart, who passed away in 2009. Jeff was the project coordinator, and the Senior Seminar Exhibitions have been a highlight of the New Albany High School community for many years now. Senior Seminar was created to allow students to design, organize, document, execute, and present their own learning. Students even determine the schedule they will follow with multiple course options, with presentations in August, December, and April, in a class format of either face-to-face -face or blended. The mission of Senior Seminar is to encourage students to become articulate, critical thinkers, thoughtfully focused citizens, academically competitive learners, and reflective problem solvers. The class of 2021 will be remembered as the class of the COVID pandemic, and obviously everything has been a little different this year. I'm used to speaking to a theater full of students, staff, parents, and judges, only to rush off to the next senior event for the day. So while we'd much rather be together to celebrate today, I am thankful that we are safe, healthy, and still able to celebrate the seniors and their senior seminar projects in this unique way. And while we are officially recognizing five finalists and 53 distinguished honor projects today, we are truly proud of the tenacity, independence, and accomplishment of all of our seniors who have successfully completed senior seminar. This year especially, it is quite the accomplishment. I also want to applaud the members of the senior team who not only have provided guidance for the students throughout their project, but have also supported them and their parents through the excitement, emotions, and chaos that have accompanied this unprecedented year. They have shown incredible support and encouragement of the seniors' academic and emotional needs during this time, and their efforts to creatively recognize the class of 2021 have been tireless. I am honored to work with the following members of the senior team. Project coordinator and math teacher Karen Moreland, senior class advisor Jenny Sage, English teacher Ben Arthurs, English teacher Avery Bulla, biomedical innovations teacher Jesse Dorman, band director Darren Falk, English teacher Elizabeth Gonda, global language teacher Megan Guthrie, vocal music teacher Carrie Horton, drama teacher Elliot Lemberg, science teacher Greta Manning, science teacher Greg Morris, global language teacher Yen Oman, math teacher Mackenzie Pesaconis, intervention specialist Dawn Cerny, and English teacher Lynette Turner. Students, faculty, family members, on-site advisors, and friends, thank you all for your support of this class of 2021. Class of 2021, we are so proud of you. Thank you. It is my honor to introduce our judges for this year's Senior Seminar Exhibition of Finalists. First, representing our school district leadership, we welcome the Assistant Superintendent of New Albany Plain Local Schools, Mrs. Lori Lofton, and the Director of Secondary Curriculum, Dr. Shirley Hamilton. Next, we have Mr. Kevin Freeman, Assistant High School Principal. We will miss Mr. Freeman as he moves across the street next year, but thank him for supporting students and attending so many senior seminar presentations. His lesson to us is to show up. The last two judges with us today are retired New Albany High School teachers, Mrs. Mary Darling and Mr. Steve Benedict. The two were founding members of the team who created our senior seminar program and it is so good to see their faces back home again. We thank all of our judges for joining us today. Hi everyone, my name is Gavin Fancher and today I'm going to be presenting my engineering internship with my time at 4 o'clock prosthetics. 
Um, Albert Einstein once said that scientists investigate that which already is, where engineers create that which has never been. And Elon Musk said that engineering is the closest thing to magic that exists in the world. Both of these men had a love and admiration for engineering, and through my time with Form 5, I came to share those same feelings. For my internships, I spent 170 hours with Mr. Aaron Westbrook at Form 5 Prosthetics Incorporated, which is a nonprofit that 3D prints prosthetics for those in the limb difference community. I think of this engineering internship as very unique, not just in the realm of senior seminar projects, but also in the realm of in engineering internships. I wasn't just sitting in boardrooms or watching presentations. I was truly getting my hands and using my hands and working all the time, which was a, a great experience, and I'm very thankful that Aaron let me do that. I think of my project in two phases, which I'll explain later, but in those phases, I learned a few key things. One is the engineer's mindset, and then I learned the skill of determination and the quality of grit. This is Aaron Westbrook here, and he is the founder and CEO of Form 5 Prosthetics, as well as a New Albany alum. I think to really understand how this project helped me mature and grow, it is important to understand why I wanted to do it. I did robotics when I was in elementary school and middle school, and I always knew that engineering was something, would be something that I wanted to do in the future. And I also had this true um, interest in 3D printing, and Form 5 was just the perfect thing for me because it combined my interest in mechanics as well as 3D printing and how 3D printing can be used in the, in the engineering world. So this is phase one. This comprised about 80 to 90 hours of my initial, of my project. And this is what I call the stage where I learned 3D, 3D printing mastery. At the time, Form 5 was producing a crazy amount of COVID shield, face shields for the surrounding communities to protect them against the virus. And during this time, they were printing the same thing over and over again on the printers. And so this allowed me to truly understand the 3D printers, all nine of them, for each individual component that they had. And that was truly beneficial for what I'll explain later in phase two. And while I was working with these 3D printers, Form 5 also had another intern who was a senior at Ohio State for Mechanical Engineering. And he truly showed me what the engineer's mindset was, how to diagnose problems, how to be creative in my problem solving, and that was immensely, immensely important for my development. And then I was also able to learn some of the design software, which would help me later in my time with Form 5. As you can see pictured on the screen with a little red arrow, there is a little base plate for what is a camera to look at the 3D, printed, at 3D printers and their filament levels. And I designed that myself. And what was super important about that was that Aaron allowed me to to develop my own skills and fundamentally understand the programs, which I didn't before, which was super beneficial for um, phase two. And as you can see here on the screen, there are hundreds of face shields being packaged and cleaned and ready to distribute to the community. Phase two is arguably my favorite phase. Um, Aaron can attest to it as well. It is just one of the best things I've ever done. Um, COFAB is what this phase two is. COFAB stands for collaborative collaboration and fabrication, and it is an event put on by Form 5, and they go out into the community and search for anyone who may be in need of a prosthetic for their daily life or for a specific task. And so they picked three participants this year, and the one who was on my team was a little boy named Jack, pictured here on the right. Um, he does not have a right hand or wrist, um, and he really wanted to ride a bike. I have to admit, he could ride a bike already pretty well, better than I could at his age, um, but he was getting some soreness and just wanted a better overall experience. And so the process we took was to understand what his goals were, any design liking, likings he had, and we developed a few different prosthetics. On the right, you can see me fitting him for what we call like a basic cup prosthetic, and that was just to understand the size of his forearm. Um, and then we developed uh, what you see here on the left, which is a more bulky prosthetic, but we call that more a proof of concept. Um, and that's another great important part of 3D printing in the field of engineering, because we were able to come out and within 24 to 48 hours, turn an idea into a physical product to test out. And it turns out that Jack really didn't like 
um, the way that it felt, and he felt kind of trapped in there. And the only way he would have felt that was by using a 3D printer to create that product in such a short amount of time. Um, and another great part about CoFab was I was able to collaborate with a lot of professionals. Um, I was working with senior designers at Honda. I was working with college professors. I was working with in industrial design majors as well as physical therapists. And being able to use those connections, which I still use to this day, to help me understand the field better and make new connections has been super helpful. Um, here you can see me and my team working to try to come up with a creative solution for Jack. Some obstacles and challenges that I faced um, was working with Jack initially. He was a very timid and kind of staff standoffish, which I completely understand. He was three years old and he, we were big towering adults asking him all sorts of questions about his likes and dislikes and at that point he just liked cars. Um, and so for Jack, once he truly understood that we tried to help him and we were trying to make his writing experience better, he really opened up to us and that was truly rewarding in, in so many ways to have that little kid just be excited about something the way that he was. Um, and then working with 3D printers, they're not just plug and play or as simple as turning on a machine. They are very complex devices and through my time in phase one where I truly learned all about the intricacies of the 3D printers, I was able to help in certain situations like the one you see here on your screen. Um, that is what we call like a printer, uh, printer glove, uh, where all sorts of stuff went wrong. Um, and I was able to, through my understanding in the first phase, I was able to, um, with that specific printer, I was able to tear it down and reconstruct it and reprogram it to do the job that we wanted it to do. Um, COFAP, which is a three-day event, um, on the second day, all the teams had already had all their designs ready, and we were ready to print them. But seven of the nine printers were not working. And considering Aaron was doing a job that was probably fit for five people running the whole event, I was the only one there with adequate 3D printing knowledge. And so I was able to diagnose the problem, go through and assess the different things that were wrong with the printers, like their leveling, filament procedures, and stuff like that. And I was within two hours, I was able to completely fix all the printers. And that was super crucial because we were able to get our um, our prosthetics to the kids that needed them that day, which was um, extremely rewarding, not just for our team, but the entire team and the event as a whole. Um, in this project, I learned a lot of things, but a few I'd like to highlight are here on the screen. Um, my desire to be an engineer was truly affirmed. Um, I had suspicions that I wanted to be in the engineering field with robotics, and being able to be put in such a great situation of COFAB and really have to work with teams of diverse um, specialties and interests, I was really able to understand that engineering was something I truly wanted to do. And I will be studying mechanical engineering um, in the fall next year at college. Also, I had to learn um, what creative problem solving was and its role in such an analog field um, as engineering. Being creative is extremely important cr in creating new and original procedures as well as ideas and that was truly something that I learned and I only gained by hands-on experience. Um, and then I also learned how important being vulnerable is. Um, I'm not a person who asks for help really ever, especially not among people who I really care about and who are significantly more experienced than myself in a situation like COFAB, but I was able to, through the help of Aaron and some other of my teammates, I was truly able to open up and ask for help, which my peers really respected and appreciated because they saw that I was trying to understand what they were talking about and the processes they were going through. And it was just a great experience and I grew tremendously as a person, not just as an engineer. Um, and then I also learned that failure is a necessary part of success. Um, talking about the 3D printers as well as the software. When I was learning to design different devices, I had to learn the program in a fundamental sense. And being able to do that allowed me to be more creative with my designs and creations because I wasn't just following a step-by-step -step guide to finally get a project out there, but I was really being able to do what I really thought was the right solution. Um, and I'd just like to say thank you to my parents who always uh, support me in any of my endeavors um, and 
They are just super great, and thank you guys. Um, and then a huge thank you to Aaron Westbrook and Form 5 for believing in me and supporting me over 170 hours of my project. And I am happy to announce that I will be doing another 200 hour internship with them this summer. Um, and then thank you to the senior seminar team for creating a project which pushed me out of my comfort zone and I truly grew. And I think the goal of senior seminar is not just to create um, a good experiences for kids, but also to find new passions. And that is something I truly experienced. I put in more hours than was necessary for my requirements, and not because I wanted to go above and beyond, but it was truly something that I really enjoyed. And I think that was a true blessing. Um, and just to tie back what Albert Einstein and Elon Musk said about creation and magic. Um, Form 5 and CoFab capture the true essence of what creation is. And through my team, Jack, through my team, through me and my team, we were able to present Jack with a device, and I'd like to share that here with you now, a final rendering of it. Uh, he's a big Captain America fan, so we tried to include a little detachable shield there. Um, but truly, the look in his eye when we presented it and the smile on his face is, I think, truly what Elon Musk meant by magic. Thank you. Thank you so much, and I hope you enjoy. My name is Olivia Gittins, and over the summer, I completed a civic virtue project with the Second and Seventh and Seventh Foundation. Students who don't read proficiently by the third grade are four times likelier to drop out of school. This quote from the Amy E. Casey Foundation symbolizes exactly why I decided to do a civic virtue project with the Second and Seventh Foundation. The mission of the Second and Seventh Foundation is to promote reading by providing free books and positive role models to kids in need while, for, or while encouraging young athletes of the community to pay it forward. So over the summer, I completed 80 hours with my on-site advisor, Amy Hoyne, the executive director of the Second and Seventh Foundation. This nonprofit organization is based in Columbus, Ohio, and was created by three former OSU football players in 1999. Um, a few reasons why I chose to do the project with the Second and Seventh Foundation was to gain experience and knowledge on a career I'm interested in, which is teaching, and I also got to give back to the community that shaped me into the person I am today. And lastly, I got to leave a lasting impression on the younger generations of the community, and I will hopefully continue this um, summer reading group for years to come. So for my project hours, I first started by creating the summer reading group, and I worked closely with Mrs. McLeod, a teacher at New Albany, a second grade teacher, and she gathered up nine students who seemed interested in the summer reading group, and that was my first group. And then Mrs. DeLong reached out to me um, about a summer reading group that she had already made for students at risk for not passing the Ohio State test. And so out of that, I got 27 students to work with, and in total, I made four groups out of the 36 students that seemed interested in a summer reading group. So on Mondays, I would work with group one from 9.30 to 10. Um, Tuesdays, I would work with groups two, three, and four from nine to 11. And then Wednesdays, I would work with all groups from 9 to 11. And Thursdays, groups 2, 3, and 4, 9 to 11, again. Um, after setting up my groups, I worked closely with a few fellow student athletes so that the kids weren't just listening to me the whole time, and I got to hear from some guest speakers. So I worked closely with Haley Dennis, Allison Dressel, Cleese Brown, Bella Vinciguera, and Katie Kochek. So next, as you can see in the bottom right picture, um, I made individually wrapped goodie bags for each of the students. And inside, there were 12 books and one highlights magazine that the Second and Seventh Foundation provided. And so in total, it took me about five hours to deliver um, all these goodie bags to all the 36 students labeled with their names. And I also met with some parents at the Naomi Public Library to um, give them their uh, goodie bags. So after my summer reading group, I decided to do two fundraisers to give back to the Second and Seventh Foundation for all that they've done for me. So I first started with an Instagram fundraiser and then a Facebook one, and I'll go more into detail on that later. 
Um, lastly, I reached out to um, Janet Kassoff, the senior program manager at the Second and Seventh Foundation, and I got to research all the programs that the Second and Seventh Foundation is looking to reach out to. So, a sample day in my class would start with me creating a lesson plan the day before, and this would usually take about an hour and a half to come up with new ideas and new things for the kids to talk about each day. Um, I would then go 10 minutes early to each class and get to know the kids more on a personal basis rather than just teaching to them and them answering my questions. I got to know them more about their likes and dislikes. Um, I also read through Hogmore's book that the, each of them had and we discussed questions um, that I came up with and also that were in the book. So the kids were always super energetic and I asked a question one day about pets and um, I can now successfully say that I know each of my kids favorite um, their pet's name, the cutest thing they do, and um, um, how many pets they have. So it was definitely a highlight of my day, along with a student of mine named Emily who would rollerblade some of the days and would just have the biggest smile on her face the whole time. Um, so for my two fundraisers, I first started with an Instagram fundraiser that was directed towards my peers, and I raised $84 through that. And then the Facebook fundraiser, um, it was directed towards the members of the community, and I raised $660 from that. Um, what I learned through this experience is that teaching is a fun job that requires a lot of hard work, and I definitely have a newfound um, respect for all the teachers that I've had before and that I'll have later in life. Um, I enjoy getting the opportunity to, to help children succeed. It makes me happy to see them enjoying what they do and learning new things. Student athletes should not underestimate the positive influence they can have on children because knowing that you're making a lasting impression on someone and that they'll remember it forever is um, unforgettable. Fundraisers require a lot of planning and cooperation and I could not have done everything with this much success without um, a lot of help. Before I end my presentation, I want to say thank you to my OSA, Amy Hoyne, and Janet Kassoff, Mrs. Marlin, my primary advisor, Mrs. DeLong, everyone who donated, and especially my students. Um, Mrs. Hurst, a teacher at New Albany, um, whose son Landon was in my group, decided to say he loves his time with you, and this was definitely the highlight of my summer after reading this. Thank you. So for my senior seminar project, I interned under an aerospace engineer at the Wright-Patterson Air Force Research Lab, and this experience was 100% virtual. I mainly worked with a hypersonic aircraft called the NASA X-43 and learned how to model it geometrically and analyze it aerodynamically. So just for a little background, a hypersonic is an aircraft that can fly five times faster than the speed of sound. But the X-43, on the other hand, can travel around 10 times faster, or approximately 7,300 miles per hour. So ever since I was young, I have been super interested in STEM and took classes and participated in clubs that would challenge myself in that area. And over time, I grew accustomed to STEM disciplines like computer science and mechanical engineering, but I wanted to continue learning and step outside my comfort zone. So 
with this is one of the reasons why I decided to intern at the research lab. I wanted to explore an engineering discipline that I knew very little about, in my case, aerospace engineering, to reimagine what's possible for me in the future and use my problem solving skills at the next level. So during my internship, I worked with Dr. Jose Camberos, who is a senior aerospace engineer at the Wright-Patterson Air Force Research Lab. He has over 25 years of experience and I worked with him for approximately 30 hours. So in the beginning of my internship, I did a lot of reading. I read the book, Introduction to Aeronautics, A Design Perspective, to give me a better understanding of aerodynamic equations and aerospace engineering. And at the end of each chapter, I completed practice problems and formatted my work to engineering standards, as you can see in the image on the right. After reading, I decided to create a model of the X-43. But before creating a 3D geometric model, I decided to build a 2D digital model. So I found a diagram of the X-43 online and labeled different parts of the aircraft using coordinates. And this made it easier to calculate numerical aircraft parameters like taper ratio, aspect ratio, and area. And also made it easier for me to build the geometric model. So to create the geometry, I used a software called Jet Designer. And Jet Designer is formatted like a spreadsheet. So I mainly inserted values into the geometry table outlined in red, as well as the spreadsheet under the geometry tab. So by inserting values that I found with the help of math and my digital model, I was able to come up with this basic top view and side view of the X43. And over time, after performing more detailed calculations, I was able to generate a more detailed and accurate model of the X-43. So in summary, it took several rounds of trial and error to get the best geometric model, which I would eventually use for my aerodynamic analysis. So the first thing I was able to find is the lift curve slope. And the lift curve slope is important to know because it gives you a better understanding of how the aircraft will perform in the air while flying. So the lift curve slope is the relationship between lift and the angle of attack. So I'm gonna define a couple of terms just for clarification purposes. So lift is the upward force that helps an aircraft fly. And the angle of attack is the angle between the oncoming wind and the aircraft. So not only did I find the slope for the X-43 itself, I found it for one of its wings and an airfoil. So a wing is 3D, but an airfoil is a 2D cross-section of a wing. I graphed all of my results, and as you can see, the green line represents the airfoil. And it shows that the airfoil can achieve a higher lift at a lower angle of attack. And this result was expected, showing that my geometry was viable to use. I was also able to find the drag puller of the X-43. So drag itself is the force that opposes the motion of the aircraft. But drag puller is the relationship between lift and drag. So based on the graph, as speed increases, drag puller reaches its max. So this means that at that specific speed, drag is the greatest. And this is important to know because it helps you understand how the aircraft will perform at different So in total, I spent 177 hours on my project, and for coursework, I spent around 34 hours. For my research, I focused on several different aspects of engineering. For my preliminary research, I read articles about hypersonics and how they have evolved over the years. For my first lit review, I went back in time to learn about the Wright brothers' revolutionary my interview review was about an issue that I'm passionate about solving, which is the gender and racial disparity in STEM. I talked to my on-site advisor, Dr. Camberos, and one of his colleagues, Mr. Evan Burke, and learned that disparities exist in their workplace. 
And finally, for my second lit review, I was curious to learn about engineering ethics and found out that in some companies, taking risks became so normalized that it led to bad engineering decisions. So before the internship, I had never been exposed to aerospace engineering. So during my first couple of weeks, I had to learn entirely new content. Sometimes I felt like I was behind and I wasn't accomplishing the main objective, which was to create a geometric model. But over time, after you know, several hours of hard work and asking many questions to my on-site advisor, I was able to overcome this and became comfortable using Jet Designer. So despite these setbacks, I learned a lot. I was able to enhance my communication skills because every single day I was getting on a call with my on-site advisor. And this made me more confident in asking questions, letting him know that I was confused on certain topics, and just sharing progress in general. And finally, I realized how important it is to be persistent. You know, modeling the X43 took several tries, and each time the geometry looked better and better. I realized that I should stop on my first try, and that there's always room to improve. So this internship gave me the opportunity to step outside of my comfort zone and use my problem-solving skills in a completely different I learned that the aerospace engineering industry is constantly innovating to create new and faster aircrafts, and I want to be a part of that innovation, which is why I decided to pursue a track related to aerospace engineering in the future. So before I conclude my presentation, I'd like to give a special thanks to three people. I'd like to say thank you to Dr. Camaros for being a very supportive on-site advisor. I'd also like to thank one of his colleagues, Mr. Evan Burke, for his guidance throughout my whole internship. And finally, I'd like to say thank you to Mrs. Gonda for being an amazing senior seminar advisor and answering all of my questions. So during the internship, I was able to learn from professionals who are reimagining the future and creating tomorrow's technology. The Wright-Patterson Air Force Research Lab has a mission of serving others <clears throat> and our country by providing the resources to keep us safe. But the technology they create provides a foundation for aircrafts that will make it more accessible for us to connect with other parts of the world. I'm grateful that I got the opportunity to contribute a little something to the aerospace engineering world, and I'm excited to continue being an engineer that continues to improve the lives of others. Thank you. Hi, my name is Riley McNabb, and for my senior seminar project, I decided to run a half marathon. And while I've always been a dedicated athlete, and I've played volleyball and basketball, among other sports my whole life, running has always been my least favorite aspect of the sport. So I definitely wanted to challenge myself in this project and do something that wasn't exactly enjoyable, but definitely would give me um, a learning stretch. So kind of an overview of what I did and I learned. So a quote that really stood out to me is, if it doesn't challenge you, it won't change you. I recognized that whatever I planned to embark on had to test me in order for me to truly grow. While no project is easy, when selecting a project, I knew I wanted to select something that would truly help me grow and be uncomfortable. So I decided that a half marathon would be the perfect thing. So kind of an overview of what I did and what I learned. Um, I did half marathon first and foremost, but not only did I work, um, work on running, but I also worked on cross training to make sure that I wasn't straining my body and also kind of just changing things up um, so it wouldn't be the same running day to day. I also focused on many lifestyle changes in terms of my workout regimen, and I also ate healthy, cooked new recipes, and grocery shopped. All those things um, allowed me to just have fun with the project, and I was also able to run with others and try new workouts in order to be successful in my project. Some things that I learned, um, with each run I gained lots of experience, but some of the highlights were discipline, and I just learned how sticking to a daily workout regimen is um, immensely great, and then also um, I learned a lot from my on-site advisor. Um, his name's Eric Fruit, and he's a multi-marathoner, and he provided a lot of insight, um, lots of tips on running and just tricks and everything that um, really helped me grow in my abilities as a runner. I also learned how capable I am 
And just with a few changes, I was able to feel so much better. And even since then, I continue to run and it's changed my life immensely. I also learned how to be relentless. And even in the face of fear or trials, I was able to persevere. Through training, I came to realize the powerful connection between the mind and the body. And the mental aspect of it can really help you overcome many physical challenges. My body told me to quit miles ago, but my soul kept me running. I like to say that um, it was really my soul that got me through and my heart and mind um, that just helped me to persevere. And even that when my body was aching or I felt like I couldn't continue, um, I just was able to persevere because I had a strong and positive mentality. I like to say that I ran the first third with my head, the second third with my legs, and the last third with my heart. It was really my heart that got me through and without my mind and just being ready at the beginning and setting a positive mentality for the first third, I definitely wouldn't have have been able to get through the run. So in terms of my project process, I chose this, pros uh, this project because I want to become a better runner. I also, um, being a senior going into a two tough sports season, wanted to be able to be a better runner. So I knew that this would be something that I didn't exactly want to do, but it would be um, very impactful and help me um, pay off in the long run. I also wanted to have a, he a healthier lifestyle because admittedly I was not always eating the healthiest or working out every single day and also just to learn more about myself and change my mentality. There's a lot of self-doubt that goes on my, in my head as an athlete, so this was an opportunity for me to be alone with my thoughts and single them out in order to promote um, positive self-talk. I also was able to learn from the expertise of my on-site advisor, which was another reason that I chose this project. I like to say I didn't just run half of something, I crushed 13.1 miles of everything. While it was a half marathon, I was definitely crushed 13.1 miles of everything, and each mile um, was just a new challenge, but I was able to persevere and continue on, and um, ultimately be able to be successful. I gave my best effort because I knew that I was worth it, and I knew that I deserved to run the best um, and get the best out of every mile. So the long anticipated part, I was successful in my goal, and I officially ran a half marathon. So here is me all sweaty um, after running 13.1 miles. I did end up running it virtually due to COVID, which was defi definitely more difficult because I didn't have the motivation of fellow runners or crowds to keep me going. So I definitely had to rely on my own grit and determination in order to motivate me, especially through those difficult miles. But despite that, I was able to be successful. So kind of a breakdown of my project hours. Um, encompassing my overall training, I had the physical aspect and then also my diet. So I followed my running plan that my on-site advisor created for me, but I also cross-trained whether that be in volleyball or basketball or just doing different workouts. And then I also focused on my diet and I had healthy eating plans. I um, cooked new recipes to try to you know, incorporate new ideas into my diet and just overall focus on the two in order to successfully complete my project in the culmination. So kind of a breakdown of the project hours. I did stick to a strict routine, so each day I have something that I do. Um, some days I would do something for my diet and I'd run, other days I would just focus on one. Um, and then throughout that I completed coursework. Um, so among the cross training, running plan, meals and shopping, and new recipes I tried, I also worked with my advisor. Um, we had meetings and went over weekly tips and just different reminders. And periodically we did meet in person too. And then I also focused on my coursework. Kind of a sample run is I would start off, I would warm up and I would do different static and dynamic stretches. I would run around the block and I would just cue my music, get ready, you know, just do a, say a quick little prayer and get ready for running. And then I would go ahead and complete the actual run. Um, some runs would be a little bit shorter than others, but on the weekends I typically did my long runs. And then I would do a quick cool down and I would jog and stretch it out and just, you know, kind of finish the actual physical aspect. And then after each run, I made sure to write a little quick reflection and document any numbers or times that I had just so that I could make sure I was sticking to my goals. In terms of research, I had the unique opportunity to interview many people and also do literature reviews and preliminary research. And one of my um, most memorable research papers was about the, po the power of a positive mindset. I literally think that that was probably the biggest thing that got me through because I was not qualified to really run a half marathon. While I did train a lot, it was definitely grueling and took a lot on my body. 
But the biggest thing was just throughout the entire run saying, you've got this and you can do it. And I basically saw this paper come to life when I actually ran it. Here are my goals. So um, here's a chart. And I was able to successfully complete each of them. You can see in yellow that is the final data point. So I have my pre, mid, and post tests. In each of these, I was able to successfully complete, which is very exciting to say. And so um, here's the tangible numbers of my pre, mid, and post tests. So I worked on planks, wall sits, lunges. And then I also um, worked on my endurance to see how long I could run consecutively. And I also um, wanted to lose weight and I beat all of my goals. So I did have immense success with my goals, but they're, they were definitely not easy accomplishment. I overcame various obstacles and challenges. Some of the big ones included fatigue and burnout. I also got sick at times and even threw up on a couple of my runs. Um, I also battled a negative mentality during many of my runs, which was a lot harder than you would see. Um, sometimes it's the mental stuff that are the hardest to overcome, but I was able to. And also even just busyness, um, you know, playing sports and being really involved in a lot of things in my community, it was really tough to sometimes get out there and run. But I was able to combat it by sticking to a strict routine and just trying to motivate myself and um, also just working on my diet and hydration and resting in order to successfully complete my goals. I like to focus on positive affirmations when I want to quit. The mind is a really powerful muscle and can significantly impact your perception of what you can and can't do. There's a quote that says, whether you believe you can or you can't, you're right. So whatever you focus your mind on is what you actualize, and I was able to actualize my goals because I believe this important lesson, and I really think that this applies to many situations. Even my, when my legs were tired, I was running with my heart, and it wasn't my legs that were giving out, it was definitely my head that was giving up. So by being able to recognize this on my runs, I was able to be more successful. So some other things that I learned. A quote that I really liked is, strength doesn't come from what you can do, it comes from overcoming the things you once thought you couldn't. Never would I have thought in a million years that I'd be able to run 13.1 miles, just something that I couldn't fathom. Um, but when I was faced with this coming stretch project, I knew that it helped me grow and be the perfect challenge for me, so I was eager to complete it. Some things I learned about running is, I'd say, I'd say that everything I wanted to learn about myself, I could learn in 13.1 miles. I had plenty of time to reflect on each run, and I knew that tough runs didn't always last, but tough runners do. And there's just a pride in finishing that's so much greater than any pain that I could have endured. So I was able to reflect and recognize how far I've come, and I know that I have so much left. I also learned a lot about myself, and my interests, and even my future plans. I just learned how powerful my body is, and how much my mind dictates um, what I do. I also learned that distance is merely a number. Before this project, I wasn't even able to run you know, that many miles, but 13.1 um, just seemed so much smaller after that. And I also learned how to be my own competitor, especially considering I had to run the race virtually and I didn't have anyone else around me to compete with. Some things that I do differently is I definitely like to reflect a little more. I like to cook even more recipes and just focus on that earlier training when um, I was running the shorter runs. I also love to run a real race in person, which um, as you guys will hear about later, I do have plans to do that. And I'd also love to complete a, a full marathon in the future. It was 26,200 steps, 23,056 yards, 69,268 feet, 830,016 inches, and 13.1 incredible miles over 200 hours of project work and coursework later. It was an incredible accomplishment and I was able to successfully run. So here's the pictures that we have from the race. Um, definitely sweaty, I ran it in the summer, but, um, and then here's some of the artifacts, some little music and AirPods and stuff like that that got me through. Then also some cool sites that I saw while I was running and some people that I got to run with even the little girls that I nanny. And then also um, here are just some fun pictures, some you know silly things of when I was running, some jumping pictures. And not only did I run a half marathon, but I'm so excited to announce that I officially ran another one since then. So I have been um, sticking to my goals. I've had the discipline to be able to replicate this success. So this was just yesterday, actually. Um, I had anticipated on running a full marathon um, before um, I knew when I was going to be presenting this and I just decided, you know what, I'm going to go out and 
um, continue and run another one. So here are some pictures. I ran all the way to Worthington. And so um, here's me finishing. And so the sweet part of it was I ran to my grandparents' house who I hadn't seen in over a year. And I was able to run to them and give them a hug um, because I had just gotten vaccinated, um, fully vaccinated. So I was able to um, just go up to them and see them for the first time in over a year. So it was great. Um, and I definitely had some extra motivation in running that half marathon to get to them. So I also plan on um, May 23rd, coming up soon, um, actually by the time you guys are watching this, will probably have already happened, um, running a full marathon in Worthington. So I guess I was just kind of getting a little um, feel for the train, you know, when I was doing that. Um, but I am already accomplishing the goals that I set six months ago, talking about how I wish to run a full marathon. So I've definitely grown immensely and continue to stick to my training regimen, which has been awesome. So I just thank you so much for listening to this project. And had it not been for this project, I probably wouldn't have set these goals for myself. And I wouldn't have learned these lessons that will carry me for miles. Thank you. Hi, my name is Catherine Muslow, and for my senior seminar project, I completed an 80-hour internship at Dress for Success Columbus. There is real power in women helping women. This quote by Ms. Coleman is the fundamental ideology of Dress for Success. During my time at Dress for Success, I not only witnessed, but contributed to the power of helping women. What is Dress for Success? Dress for Success is a nonprofit organization that helps women achieve economic independence by providing clothing for work, helping them prepare for interviews, and empowering them to feel confident in who they are. These women come from prison, halfway houses, and shelters. They are trying to change their lives, and Dress for Success is helping them start. Why Dress for Success? I chose to volunteer at Dress for Success because ever since I was a child, I have loved fashion and styling outfits. I also really enjoy making people feel confident about who they are. Prior to my project, I only knew about parts of the Dress for Success organization and the, their mission. I knew that it was a place to donate clothing for women to wear to work because my family had donated some of my grandmother's clothing. For my internship, I wanted to learn about personal styling and the overall operation at Dress for Success. Who was my on-site advisor? My on-site advisor was Rhea Okuniyama. She was the volunteer and contributions manager at Dress for Success, but she has recently retired from this position. During my internship, I was able to meet with her regularly about my project progress, and she taught me how to manage the warehouse and stock room. I volunteered at Dress for Success for a total of 80 hours. My hours were split, bet were split between four jobs. I worked in the warehouse for 35, the stock room for 15, I styled outfits for 25, and I helped fit clients for five hours. Next, I will be talking about a typical day at Dress for Success and what working in the different components looks like. The three main areas of my work at Dress for Success were in the warehouse, the stock room, and the boutique. I would start off my day in the warehouse. Working in the warehouse was very busy and extremely hot. I would sort through donations that had been previously sanitized from the other day and make three piles of clothing. One pile of clothing of business professional clothes that can go to the boutique, a second pile of clothing of good quality clothing that Dress for Success would sell later on during one of their annual sales, and a third pile of clothing that would be donated to the Volunteers of America. I would unload donations from donors' trunks and fill out receipt forms. I would label shoes with sizes, sort through clothing for the sale, and pick up around the warehouse. Then I would go back to the boutique and work in the stock room. I would bring a cart of clothes sorted for the boutique. I would sort these items and count them in using an inventory sheet, which is a sheet that the organization uses to keep track of all of the items that are donated that day. I would hang in steam clothes, 
put new clothes on the boutique floor. I would sanitize shoes and jewelry, put together personal care bags of conditioner, shampoo, toothpaste, and toothbrushes for the women to take home with them, and I would send receipts to donors. After working in a stock room, I would move to the boutique floor. Here I would style and bag clothes for clients for two different types of students. One student is an interview student, which is for women who are applying for jobs. In this case, a personal stylist will create three different outfits to the client's liking, and they will be able to take home two. The second student is an employment student, which is for a client who has already received a job. In this case, the personal stylist will create six outfits and the client is able to take home five. I would hang up new items, clean up the racks and make them look nice, and I would suit clients, where the client would personally come in and try on an outfit and shoes. I would sanitize surfaces and dressing rooms, display new jewelry and shoes, and complete style forms, which is a form that the organization uses to keep track of the client's information and the things that they check out. My biggest job in the boutique was suiting clients. I helped several women from a, half, a halfway house, which is a home where incarcerated women live when their sentence is almost done. These women were mainly applying for food service positions, so I picked out their outfits for their interviews. When they came in to choose their outfits, it was quite an emotional experience for them. It was really exciting for me to see them so excited over clothes that they could wear in their next chapter. My favorite part of my job was styling outfits for the Boss Girls program. The program is designed to help young women prepare for their next steps in life, whether that be in the, work, the workforce, college, or at trade school. Dress for Success provides clothing to these teenage girls for their interviews. I loved browsing around the boutique and looking for pieces that younger girls would love to wear. My experience of helping eight girls by styling and having them try on clothing was really powerful. This is a picture of Sophia. She is 16. She is the one of the girls who I got to style to prepare her for an interview to become a receptionist. She loved bright colors, so I picked out this red dress for her. It was really awesome to see her try on the dress. She immediately stood taller, smiled wider, and looked beautiful. Throughout my internship, I completed two literature reviews and one interview review. For my first literature review, I researched the kinds of options that single mothers have when it comes to finding employment and getting off of welfare programs. In my second literature review, I researched why it is important to dress nicely for work and how it can impact one's confidence. And for my interview review, I interviewed Rhea Ofiniano, my on-site advisor, and Rebecca Bostrom, the office manager at Dress for Success, on their experience at Dress for Success and how it differs from their previous employment. The biggest obstacle with my internship was definitely COVID-19. At Dress for Success, there were many safety protocols put into place like masks and social distancing. Lots of normal operations like women being able to come on, come into the boutique and try on their outfits or sort new donations right away were unable to happen. I was able to overcome these challenges by following the guidelines and doing everything to the best of my ability. During my internship, I learned how to be a personal stylist how to manage the warehouse, what kinds of services that Dress for Success offers, and the overall operation of Dress for Success. After working for Dress for Success, I have learned not to take anything for granted and to be grateful for the little things that I have in my life. I have also learned a lot about myself. I have learned that I am interested in possibly running or working for a nonprofit, and I want to continue to empower and shape the lives of those around me. My experience as an intern at Dress for Success has impacted me greatly. It has changed my outlook on life because I stepped outside of my bubble to help women in situations unlike mine. Because of this, I now have a clear idea of what I want to do with my life. It has helped me realize that I am interested in human rights, public policy, changing people's lives, and nonprofit work. I was able to use my experience 
as the basis of my college application. It gave me the opportunity to apply to the special cities gateway program that's main focus is urban studies at Trinity College in Connecticut. I am very proud to say that I will be pursuing this study this fall. This experience has focused on what I want to do with my life moving forward. Because of my experience at Dress for Success, I have learned not to take anything for granted. Things like having more than one outfit, enough food for each meal, and basic hygiene products are not guaranteed for everyone. I also understand how difficult it can be for women to get a job outside of prison and how difficult living on min minimum wage is. My favorite part of working at Dress Your Success was styling outfits for women and getting to hear their stories. Overall, this experience has been invaluable because it has opened my eyes to the real world. Growing up in New Albany, I am very sheltered and I have a lot more opportunities than others. Getting to assist young women through the Boss Girls program and women with backgrounds that are not like mine has really changed me. Today, I am still an active member at Dress for Success and I volunteer regularly. Through this experience, I have made strong friendships and connections with powerful women who I have con considered some of my biggest role models. At the end of the day, there is great importance in empowering women and girls to feel strong and confident in themselves. Whether it be through a patterned blouse or a fitted dress, it can make them feel invincible. Thank you for your time and allowing me to tell you about my experience. Of the Hatfield and McCoy fame, 
Paul focused his senior seminar project on studying his family's history in the mining towns of West Virginia. Paul traveled to the towns of his ancestors to gather, study, and organize his family's history. The passion and positivity Paul displayed was infectious and made a lasting impression on the senior team who now gives this award annually to a student whose project shows the heart and drive to complete his or her project with pride, joy, and diligence. I am pleased to announce that the 2021 recipient of the Paul Hatfield Award is Nicholas Solis Ramos. Nicholas came to New Albany, Ohio, to the United States in October of this past year. He embraced the senior seminar project, although he started well after his classmates, and quickly developed a proposal for a photojournalism project centered around immigration in the United States. Nicholas researched the history of immigration and current political practices, including several interviews with immigrants who are currently working in Central Ohio. Nicholas never shied away from a task. He was willing to try anything despite the language barrier, as he used technology to com convert all his research to Spanish, write his paper, and then convert back to English. He advocated for himself when he needed clarification or had problems with his project. At the end of the course, he was so nervous to present that he wrote his entire presentation and practiced for hours at home and with Mr. Meckel to improve his English pronunciation for his final presentation. Embracing the difficult and making the best of a situation that most of us will never experience embodies every criterion of the Paul Hatfield Award. Nicholas, the senior team is so proud of you and cannot wait to see what greatness you accomplish in your future. You truly embody the spirit of Senior Seminar and we congratulate you. Consumer Math, Algebra 1 and 2, and Geometry. As chairperson of the math department, Mary Darling developed and expanded a curriculum that would not only develop a higher caliber of math student, but also keep pace with the evolving technology. She spearheaded an AP program that was rigorous and successful. As an original member of the senior team and team leader for much of that time, she created and modified the senior seminar program to fit the changing needs of the students and the school while develop, developing expectations that set the bar for senior projects across the state of Ohio. Mrs. Darling set a standard for teachers to improve the education that each student receives at New Albany High School. Her dedication to the education and well-being of our school and our staff and our students is to be commended. And so the senior team created the Mary Darling Award to honor not only Mrs. Darling, but another adult in recognition of an extraordinary time, support, and dedication to the students at New Albany High School as they complete their senior seminar project. This year, we are pleased to recognize the contributions of Eileen Pewitt. Mrs. Pewitt has served as an on-site advisor to many of our students of past, in the past few years. In her role with the New Albany Food Pantry, not only has she continued to serve as an advisor, but she has been instrumental in developing new and creative projects for our students to work on. Whether it's cooking classes, helping with the community garden, or other uh, programs at the food pantry, Mrs. Pewitt has been an endless stream of opportunities for our students to take advantage of. The community of New Albany is lucky to have Mrs. Pewitt's outreach, and the senior team is delighted to recognize the assistance Mrs. Pewitt has provided and will continue to extend to our students. Thank you, Mrs. Pewitt, for being there for our students and for our community. Good afternoon, my name is Ken Kramer and I'm the principal here at New Albany High School. Today I have the opportunity to announce this year's Project of Excellence and Project of the Year Awards. I would like to thank and recognize our five senior seminar finalists here with me today. We are very proud of you and the work that you have completed. The passion and dedication that you have shown for your project has been an excellent example of why Senior Seminar serves as a cornerstone of our school. I want to personally thank you as you have done an excellent job representing New Albany High School through this culminating experience. 
This year's Project of Excellence goes to Megana Carthen. Megana completed an internship at Rose Patterson Air Force Base Research Lab, learning how to geometrically model and aerodynam aerodynamically analyze the NASA X-43. Congratulations, Megana. This year's Project of the Year goes to Gavin Fancher. Gavin completed an internship with form aesthetics, learning about 3D printing, engineering practices, and design designing objects in CAD software. Congratulations, Gavin. Congratulations to all the young men and women, and thank you to all of our seniors who completed the projects this year with perseverance and passion in this self-directed learning experience. Thank you. Well done. This has been quite a journey for all of you, and indeed for all of your teachers and administrators as well. Right now I want to take you back to your journey through senior seminar. We have just seen what we on the senior team consider to be the best of the best, and hopefully you can see why. But so many of you have reached some of your best moments in senior seminar too. You have worked alongside doctors, lawyers, architects, business, salespeople, and CEOs, IT specialists, veterinarians, musicians, and artists, carrying yourselves as young professionals when many of you weren't 18 yet. You have achieved personal growth in your sport, personal health, musical skills, cooking skills, writing skills, artistic skills, you have designed, built, and installed new constructions. You have raised awareness and funding for charitable causes, donated your time and energy to community service, and become involved in something bigger than yourselves. It wasn't always easy, and nearly every one of you has faced a stumbling block or two, or three, or a lot, but you got past them you found an answer, you sought assistance, you backtracked, reflected, and made a new path around that block. Some of you even had to start all over, like when internships were canceled, but you got here. This is what I want you to think about today. How do you get around a roadblock? We are in the middle of an enormous roadblock right now with COVID-19 in our midst, and it's not going away soon. It has caused a lot of upset for all of you. It may cause all of us, yes, all of us, a lot more turmoil before it's over. I want you to be ready for this roadblock and all the roadblocks in your future. Backtrack, reflect. Seek assistance, find a new path, breathe, give yourself and others some grace. Certainly learn and rejoice in your successes and may they be many for you. But also learn from your moments of failure, from the real roadblocks you must pass, for they are what build and show your true character. Congratulations on getting to this grand milestone in your very young life. Now go out and do good things in the world. Mm -hmm.